For centuries, the land now known as Israel has been home to both Palestinians and Jews. But for more than 50 years, this small nation has also given rise to bloody wars, refugees, and terrorism. Two peoples, both with a claim to this land, both turning to violence when diplomacy fails. What are the roots of this conflict, and can there be peace in this divided land? Israel, Palestine. This is the birthplace of Christianity, Judaism, and also sacred to Muslims. Its holy sites are places of pilgrimage for millions. The Jews trace their history here to the time of the Bible, when God promised the land to Abraham. But the Palestinians are also descended from the ancient biblical peoples and from the Arab conquerors of the seventh century. But for the Jews, expelled from this land over the centuries by invaders, its spiritual legacy is one they've never relinquished. Jews are persecuted for centuries in Europe. The pogroms, or massacres, of the late 19th century lead many to believe they will only be safe in their own state. This belief becomes a political movement called Zionism. Then, the biggest war the world has ever seen, the First World War in 1914, means that the Jews are to come closer to a homeland. The British want allies in the Middle East. The Arabs are fighting the Turkish Ottomans for independence, and the British back them. British ally Russia is losing the will to continue, and believing the Jews could influence the Russians, the British back Jewish claims for a homeland. After the war, the Germans are defeated. The Middle East is divided between the British and the French. Palestine is now governed by Britain. Their fateful decision in 1919 to adopt the Jewish claim for a homeland as official policy is to affect the Holy Land from that moment on. The British mandate was designed specifically to bring about the creation of a national home for the Jews, which ultimately meant a state with no similar commitment to self-government or independence or statehood for the indigenous inhabitants, in other words, the Palestinian Arabs. Encouraged by the attitude of the British, 35,000 Jews emigrate to Palestine over the next four years. Palestinian unease about the influx leads to riots against the Jews and the British, culminating in the three-year Arab revolt of 1936. The Palestinians are crushed by the British and their leadership destroyed. The Jews continue to arrive, although the British start limiting numbers. The end of the Second World War makes the question of a recognized homeland a priority. Six million Jews are exterminated in the Nazi death camps during the Holocaust, and the survivors are determined that it will never happen again. With no safe haven in Europe, because countries turn them away, they look to the land of Palestine, a land the Jewish Bible, the Torah, calls Israel. But the Palestinian Arabs don't want any more Jews immigrating. And to keep the peace, the British limit the influx, turning boatloads away. The UN decide that Palestine should be divided into separate Jewish and Arab states. The Palestinian Arabs are allocated sections to the northwest, in the center, a strip by the sea, and land on the Egyptian border. The Zionists are given what remains, while Jerusalem is to be controlled by the UN. But the Palestinians reject the plan. But as Israelis celebrate, they're plunged into war. They have to defend themselves against five Arab nations, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, who launch an attack. They're opposed to the creation of Israel and want to secure land for Arabs. To the world's astonishment, Israel wins its war of independence, and its victor claims some of the territory designated to Palestine. But neighboring Jordan seizes the West Bank, and more land is lost to Egypt, which claims the Gaza Strip. Jerusalem is split in two, Israel controlling the west of the city and Jordan the east. In 1956, 
a crisis erupts over the Suez Canal, a vital shortcut for ships traveling to Europe from the rest of the world. Britain and France are major shareholders, and when Egypt nationalizes the canal, they promise to give more aid to Israel if she backs them. So Israel goes to war against Egypt. A ceasefire is agreed, but there would be no lasting peace between Arab and Jew while Palestinians remain stateless. For the next 20 years, Arab countries oppose the state of Israel. Then comes the Six-Day War. Six Days War was a, a defining moment in the history of Israel. You know, since the War of Independence, 19 years, there was no major challenge to the existence of Israel. Here it comes once again. Israel turns to the United States for support. When the moment of truth came, the American commitment uh, evaporated. And we realized once again that we have uh, to rely only on ourselves. It was not easy. There was a lot of hesitation and anxiety in the political leadership. Britain and France also refuse help. And again, Israel fights alone. But in 12 hours, they completely destroy the Egyptian, Jordanian, and Syrian air forces. And within six days, wipe out their armies. Israel now has defense in depth. She creates buffer zones between herself and her enemies. She takes the West Bank from Jordan, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai from Egypt, and the Golan Heights from Syria and quadruples in size. With shifting borders, a million more Palestinians come under Israeli military rule. Trying to bring about peace, the UN passes a resolution, which is to become the basis of all future negotiations. Resolution 242 states that land now occupied by Israel will be exchanged for peace if the Arabs recognize Israel's existence. But Israel won't withdraw, and most Arab nations refuse to recognize the Jewish state. Twenty years after the birth of Israel, a new Arab leader is keen to take on the fight. Yasser Arafat becomes chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization. It's declared aim to liberate Palestine by force. From bases in neighboring Arab states, the Palestinians plan a campaign of terror against Israel. They don't have fighter planes or tanks, but they have landmines and guns. The most important thing, more important possibly than actually liberating physically bits of territory from Israeli occupation, was to shock the world into seeing the Palestinians, into recognizing that they existed, into recognizing that an injustice had happened to them. Radicals within the PLO resort to publicity-grabbing international terrorism. In 1970, they hijack three planes, divert them to Jordan, and blow them up. And this was just the start. Two years after the plane hijacks, terror comes to the Olympic Games in Munich. As the world watches, Palestinian terrorists kill 11 Israeli athletes. But this act by a PLO splinter group undermines Arafat's leadership. To regain control, he realizes that diplomacy may be the answer. Arafat is persuaded that war alone won't achieve his ends and turns to diplomacy. The Arab nations have just recognized the PLO as the sole representative voice of the Palestinian people. Now, Arafat wants legitimacy from more significant countries and addresses the UN in a major diplomatic move. I am raising the olive branch in one hand and the gun to protect this olive branch. President Jimmy Carter puts the Middle East top of his foreign agenda and invites Egypt and Israel to talks at Camp David. A year later, President Sadat of Egypt and Prime Minister Begin of Israel sign a treaty in which Israel agrees to withdraw from the Sinai. It's the first peace agreement between the Israelis and an Arab state. Israel agrees to return the whole of the Sinai to Egypt and to dismantle the settlements it's built there. 
Two years after securing peace with Israel, Sadat is assassinated by Muslim extremists. His quest for peace leads to his death. And there's to be no deal for the Palestinian refugees. Arafat's diplomatic moves are slow. The PLO now has a powerful base in Lebanon. They mount numerous assaults against Israel, shelling towns across the border, killing many civilians. Determined to deal with the PLO once and for all, Israel invades Lebanon, even entering the capital, Beirut. Acting as peace brokers, the U.S. negotiates a safe passage out of Beirut for the PLO fighters to exile in Tunis. Although there's a civil war in Lebanon, the U.S. promises the PLO that women and children left behind in the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila will be safe. Those names are engraved in the memory of the Palestinian people. The Israeli army let a Christian militia into the camps where the Palestinians are living. Just about two weeks after the final evacuation of PLO forces from Beirut, um, the Christian militias that had been brought in by the Israeli army into the refugee camps in Beirut conducted an appalling massacre of anything from 800 to possibly 2,000 people. Every living thing in the camps was eliminated basically by the right-wing Christian militias that had been allied with Israel since 1976 and armed by Israel and, and trained by Israel. There's a huge outcry around the world and half a million Israelis also protest. For the Palestinians, it's a tragedy, but exiled in Tunis, Arafat is powerless to help. Since the Six-Day War of 1967, 1 1.7 million Palestinians on the West Bank and in Gaza live under Israeli military control. After 1967, Israel builds Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza, breaching international law, which states that an occupying army can't alter land it controls. Still not recognized as a separate entity, the Palestinians have no vote and no real political voice, nor the means to complain about the settlements and settlers, or about their suppression. Tension builds up. Then four Palestinians are killed when their car collides with an Israeli patrol vehicle. Enraged by decades of military rule, the people of Gaza take to the streets. What starts as stone throwing escalates into a full-scale uprising, the Intifada, which means shaking off in Arabic. It is the resistance and the revolution of all our children, or our women, or our people, or our men. This is the accumulation of the revolution. Israel responds to the stone throwing and rebellion with the full force of a modern army pitted against unarmed civilians. Once more, the Middle East is at the center of world attention. The Intifada gives Yasser Arafat a new negotiating tool, and he intends to use it. But few anticipate his diplomatic preemptive strike. From Algeria in 1988, Yasser Arafat makes a surprise announcement. He declares the state of Palestine and in an historic move accepts the UN Resolution 242, land for peace. If Israel withdrew, the Arab countries would recognize the Jewish state. The way is now open for talks, and Arafat is invited back to the UN in December 1988. But the US insists he renounce terrorism. He worked Wouldn't gradually, at times implicitly, uh, to swing opinion within the PLO to accepting the principle of negotiation with Israel and of a compromised solution with Israel. Now, this was very difficult because he had a very strong left wing who were much more militant, who demanded uh, attachment to total liberation of Palestine. But Arafat's opponents aren't just within the PLO. 
he's always been challenged by more radical factions. A new militant group called Hamas is to become serious opposition. Hamas are part of a religious movement which sees Islam as the solution to all political problems. The politics of the Middle East changed drastically when Iraq's Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait in 1990. Arab countries previously hostile to the West join Western coalition forces to defeat Iraq. Arafat's disastrous decision to support Iraq leaves him bereft of allies. He's sidelined, and the PLO are left in the cold, just as America launch a peace initiative. In 1991, America plays host to Arab nations and Israel to negotiate a peace deal in Madrid. But it takes James Baker a year to get the parties around the table. Israel refuses to negotiate with the PLO, so delegates from Gaza and the West Bank represent the Palestinians. I think a lot of things were accomplished by Madrid. You ended up with a process between Israelis and Palestinians that for a period of time was productive. The only way you're going to solve the problem is through political dialogue. But unknown to the Americans and away from the scrutiny of the world, there are secret talks in Oslo between the Israelis and the PLO. With the election of Yitzhak Rabin in Israel, peace becomes a priority, and he encourages the meetings. And in Norway, the PLO and Israeli negotiators bond. The chief US negotiator realizes the significance of the moment. I said to the secretary, this is historic. Here are two national movements that have rejected each other's existence, and now they're accepting each other's existence. Back in Washington, a declaration of principles is signed. It lays the groundwork for the beginning of Palestinian self-rule and Israeli withdrawal from the territories it's occupied. Israel agrees to withdraw from areas of the West Bank and Gaza and to gradually give control to the newly created Palestinian Authority. First, they withdraw from Gaza and Jericho, and then from seven major towns in the West Bank. The rest of the West Bank is divided into separate zones under varying degrees of Israeli control. The sensitive issues of Jerusalem, borders, settlers, and the refugees are left for later discussions. Just two years after the peace process starts, it stopped in its tracks. If you ask me what was the one violent incident that more than any other derailed Oslo, I would tell you it was a single bullet. It was the bullet that was fired in November 1995 that killed the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, because that bullet fired by a Jewish extremist, an Israeli right winger, um, destroyed the man who more than any other gave Israelis confidence in the peace process. Like Anwar Sadat before him, Yitzhak Rabin's quest for peace cost him his life. It's for several months, his successor, Shimon Peres, struggles to fulfill Rabin's legacy and keep the spirit of the Oslo Accords alive. Rabin's partner in peace, Yasser Arafat, returns from exile to Gaza. He is elected as president of the new Palestinian Authority in 1996 and, following the Oslo Accords, begins to build up the infrastructure of a state. Israeli troop withdrawal begins, but Israel still retains overall control of the occupied territories. The Palestinians hope that within five years, they'll become fully independent. But the extremists are not going to let the peace process continue. The campaign to destabilize the country gathers pace. Israel suffers a wave of bombings against civilians. The Israelis have had enough, and within a few months, they elect right-winger Benjamin Netanyahu, who promises peace with security. 
Netanyahu opposes the Oslo Accords and slows down their implementation. Dismayed that the peace process has slowed under Netanyahu, the Israelis vote in Ehud Barak in 1999. In the final days of his presidency, Bill Clinton is looking for a grand finale. He hopes to bring peace to the Middle East and invites the Israelis and Palestinians to Camp David II in July 2000. Prime Minister Barak believes he's offering an unprecedented settlement. The deal includes withdrawal from more than 90% of the Israeli-occupied territories, but the Palestinians want further discussion. The peace talks fail once again, heightening tension in the region. Right-wing politician Ariel Sharon chooses this moment to visit the Muslims' holiest place in Jerusalem. With the permission of the prime minister, he arrives with an armed guard and enters the Muslim sanctuary known as Haram al-Sharif, or Temple Mount to the Jews. Violence erupts, leading to a second intifada. A month later, Palestinians lynch two Israeli army reservists. And for Israel, these deaths symbolize the barbarity of Palestinian mob violence. Tensions escalate, Palestinian suicide bombings against Israel intensify, and Prime Minister Barak loses faith. The Israeli public want a hardliner to crack down on the Palestinians. They elect Likud leader Ariel Sharon in the hope that this is the man who can bring security and stop the suicide bombings. To stop the terror, Sharon launches Operation Defensive Shield in March 2002, invading towns under Palestinian rule. Yasser Arafat is held hostage in his headquarters and shelled. Now the peace process is in the hands of Ariel Sharon and Yasser Arafat, longtime adversaries who symbolize the struggle for the land which lies at the roots of conflict.